The Divine Arsonist by Jacob Nordby Chapter 1 There are times on earth when extraordinary consciousness invades everyday life. There are times on earth when unseen forces make a calamity of the status quo. There are times on earth when it seems as though a divine arsonist has set fire to the world as we know it. We live in such times. Chapter 1 How are you feeling about this? You need to consider that before you make a decision, the stranger said. I sat and looked at him across the campfire flames. In the mountain darkness he seemed to flicker in and out of existence with the dancing firelight. Far away down the valley an owl hooted. Suddenly the sound was over our heads in the tall pine tree. Another owl had answered the call. Who? the owl asked persistently. Who? Who? Yes. Who indeed? Who was I? Who was living this night, and who was this visitor sharing wine with me now under the stars? The strange man sat still and looked into the fire. He appeared just a few hours ago and made me a most unusual proposition, but there was no urgency or nervousness in his manner. He was at rest and waiting for my reply, while at the same time he gave me the sense that I could delay for decades before I answered if need be. I, on the other hand, felt anything but restful. My central nervous system was sending out the kind of alarms that signaled a fear of impending death. It was that same feeling of anticipation in the last seconds before a skydive, or just after you've strapped in for the most insane roller coaster ride at the amusement park. I was sure that my mind was about to be blown. I could not reconcile these physical sensations with my understanding of the man's words. Although what he said was not normal, it should not have triggered this powerful squeeze in my solar plexus. Something very big must be just below the surface, something that was not obvious to my conscious mind. It was as if I had crept onto the roof of a skyscraper, as if I were lying on my belly with my nose over the edge, watching the tiny people and cars moving seventy-nine stories below. Obviously, I would not fall. Yet I knew with deep inevitability, this time I would not be able to resist. Against all reason, I knew that I would leap, screaming and flailing into the unknown. I rallied my senses and drew in a deep breath. The visitor's eyes met mine and he raised his eyebrows. I don't know how I feel, I said. You do, but you don't want to admit to being afraid. He was right. I knew better than to be afraid. I had cultivated a life of fearless behavior, hadn't I? Fear was for lesser men, and I had determined long ago not to be one of them. You should be afraid, he said. Well, actually you shouldn't, but it's quite normal. That's it, though, I said. I don't shrink from challenges. I meet life head on. I believe in the power of belief. He fixed his powerful gaze on me, and I felt locked in place. You are living a life you think you should live, he said. You've built a castle in your mind and believe you're safe within its walls. If you come with me, I will take you places so far away that you may never be able to return. If you do return, you will find your castle is no more. That's why you feel afraid. So you're asking me to change my whole life, I said. I'm asking you to let me show you things you've always suspected. Once you see them, once you experience them, once you know them with all your senses, then yes, you may have a hard time going back to what you currently call your life. The day a cosmic rock cracked the windshield of life as I knew it began like any other. It happened on a bright autumn afternoon in mid-October. I was at my desk in a rare moment of stillness. Life was busy, so life was good. I was an entrepreneur, happily engaged in the pursuit of winning the big game of business. I leaned back into the leather chair and rested my neck, something I seldom did in this office, and closed my eyes. It felt great just to find a minute of quiet. My life was filled with meetings and telephone calls and debt payments and P&L sheets. I was a proud super-servant to my clients and staff. I had studied intensely to become a man of value in every way. Perhaps that's why I was so tired that day. It had been years since I had really slept well. I was famous among my friends and associates for waking up at 3.30 a.m. to devour books, write business plans, and dream up exciting schemes. A soft ding from the computer automatically brought my head up. 
My eyes blinked open and took a few seconds to focus. I was like Pavlov's dog with my Outlook email notifications. It was now a conditioned response. I had a new message in my inbox. Must check it. Always. This one was from my friend Luke. He rarely sent me notes, and when he did, they were straight from the heart. I double-clicked and a new window opened. Hey, read this today while I sat up by a lake in the Wasatch Front. Thought you'd like it, wild man. I went to the woods because I wished to live deliberately, to front only the essential facts of life, and see if I could not learn what it had to teach, and not, when I came to die, discover that I had not lived. I did not wish to live what was not life, living is so dear, nor did I wish to practice resignation unless it was quite necessary. I wanted to live deep and suck out all the marrow of life, to live so sturdily and spartan-like as to put to rout all that was not life to cut a broad swath and shave close, to drive life into a corner and reduce it to its lowest therm, terms. Henry David Thoreau Love you, buddy. Later. Luke. P.S. Call me. Something about that quote reverberated through my body like a deep gong. Boom. She. I read it again. Then again. I went to the woods to live deliberately, to front only the essential facts of life, and see if I could not learn what it had to teach, to live deep and suck out all the marrow of life. It reminded me of one of my favorite movie scenes from Dead Poets Society when Robin Williams leans in and whispers in a ghostly voice over his students' shoulders, Carpe, carpe diem, seize the day, boys, make your lives extraordinary. I rubbed my eyes and rolled my neck. I could feel the accumulated weariness after a week of stress that often showed up as a headache by Friday afternoon. Maybe today was a good time for a run to the cabin. I opened my calendar. It was hard to believe, but I didn't have much going on the rest of the day. I glanced out the window. The sun was shining, and the orange leaves on the vine maple were being played by the breeze. The phone intercom lit up, and Sheila, my assistant, said, Hey, I have a referral on the line. They want to meet you today. I closed my eyes and sighed. Ah, yes, but the business needs me. Um, okay, I can see them at four o'clock, I said. My finger hovered over the intercom button to switch it off. The gong sounded again inside me, and I felt dizzy for a moment. No, wait, Sheila, I need to get out of here today. Have one of the other guys meet them or see if they can be here on Monday, I said. She was silent for a couple of seconds. I could hear her tapping on her keyboard. All right, she said finally. I'll figure something out. I felt guilty. The company could use the extra revenue. What am I doing? I looked up when Sheila appeared in the doorway a few seconds later. She came in and leaned against the wall. She ran both hands through her dark hair and then crossed her arms. Are you doing okay today, she said. Sure, what do you mean? Oh, I don't know. You've been moody for the last few days, and it's not like you to turn down an appointment. Just check to make sure everything's okay with you. I breathed deep and let my eyes wander over my desktop. Stacks. I was a stacker. I knew everything was, but the volume of stuff that I had to keep track of always overwhelmed my ability to file it. That habit drove my neat nick partners crazy at times. I looked back up at Sheila, who was smiling a little. Yeah, I'm okay. Just kind of fried right now, I said. It's been a long week. I don't usually do this, but I'm going to take off early. Maybe head up to the cabin and get some quiet or something. That's good, she said. I worry about you sometimes. How do you mean? Oh, you know, all of this, she gestured around the office. It's all so important, but I suspect you're a lot closer to red line than you know most of the time. I was already closing down my programs and clicking the lid shut on the laptop. Well, I appreciate your concern, I said. It's all part of the game. Ride hard, get there fast. Sheila shrugged and uncrossed her arms. Get where fast? Never mind, let's just take some care with that. We don't need you burning out. I've got it covered the rest of the day. Everything will be fine. It's Friday. She turned to leave. Thank you. You know the cabin has a phone if you need me. I'll take my laptop and check email from up there, too, I said. She was shaking her head and waving her hands in the air as she left my office. Crazy people, I heard her muttered. Her question lingered in the air. Get where fast? You know, there. I felt the silent gong crash in my gut again. As soon as my car cleared the parking lot of the office complex, I knew that my historic decision to take off early on a Friday was good. Early autumn almost anywhere in the world is a wonderful season, but here in the high desert of Idaho it carries a special kind of magic. The backbone of dry summer heat broke in early September this year, after nearly three months of record-breaking high temperatures. 
Everyone was pitifully grateful for a week or two of clouds and rain. Now the weather had cleared, and the wide sky was a deep blue bowl held up by the golden hills that surround Boise. If you hiked up to the plateau known as Table Rock just outside the city, you could look down and survey the entire Treasure Valley. From there you could see why, according to the legend, the early French explorers excitedly cried out, Le bois! Le bois! The trees! The trees! As they first glimpsed this view. The entire valley is surrounded by drab, tan, and gray sagebrush desert as far as the eye can see. The Boise River bisects the capital city to create a willowy oasis along its banks, spread like a soft green carpet across the shallow floodplain. At this time of year, most of the maples were already showing tinges of orange, and many cottonwoods were donning their golden fall cloaks. My car windows were down, and I could smell the smoke that the old farmers sent up as they burned the weeds in their irrigation ditches. The family farms were rapidly disappearing around the edges of town as the new subdivisions full of miniature mansions sprouted like acres of asphalt shingled mushrooms. Here and there, though, a stubborn holdout would forgo the big payoff for selling his land and maintain his pasture with several sheep, a steer, and a couple of horses. I liked those old curmudgeons. Many of them were descendants of early Basque settlers. I often felt the urban sprawl was too quickly erasing important history and replacing it with shallow veneer of modern luxury. I plotted my next steps as I drove the short distance to my home. Arrangements must be made. My wife, Jennifer, understanding woman that she was, would need to be notified and perhaps cajoled just a bit. Our three children kept us busy all week, but my schedule often gave me an excuse to pass the mundane burdens off on her. I hoped that she wouldn't feel bad about my decision to get away without warning her first. I would pack light, but I would still, still need to change clothes and grab a few things from the store on my way out of town. Really, that was about it. I felt light and excited as the plan came together. I hadn't done something like this for far too long. It felt like cutting class and catching a matinee, a freedom I envied of the B or C students in school, but never indulged in myself. I was, and always had been, an A student. A students did not goof off. They achieved. I fished out my wireless earpiece and voice-dialed Jennifer. Hey, baby, I said when she picked up. Oh, hey, you doing all right? She blew out her breath. Well, it's been quite a day. This did not portend well for my easy escape to the mountains. What's going on? Oh, you know, nothing too crazy. Lots of stuff with the kids. They have their fall yard sale at school, and I promised to help this weekend. What's going on with you? I was relieved. This didn't sound like extraordinary stress, just the usual. I could probably trade some good behavior credits and the promise of a date night in exchange for my solitary jaunt. Well, I said, I'm officially playing hooky today. Unless it's going to mess up your life a lot, I think I'll run up to the cabin for a night or two. She didn't answer right away. Are you going up alone, she asked finally. Yes, why? Oh, well, no reason, I guess. It's just not like you to take off by yourself. I thought maybe you were making a buddy trip. Yeah, I can't exactly explain why, but I really need some quiet time right now, I said. It can't hurt. I've wanted you to make you go off by yourself for a while, but you never seem to take a real break from people. Well, all right then. So you're okay with things for a couple of days? Yeah, I'll get pizza and a movie for the kids tonight. Maybe we'll tomorrow we'll go to the park after the school yard sale. Just call me when you get up there so I'll know you're safe. This was too easy, but I had learned from years of sales experience that when someone gives you the buying signal, quit selling. Shut up and seal the deal. Press, press hard. Third copy's yours. All that. Okay, I said. Thanks for this. Let's do dinner together next week. Just the two of us. Love you. I love you too, she said. And just like that, the final piece fell into place. I built my bridge to escape from the city. Now, off to see the wizard. Half an hour later, I was checking out of the grocery store with a few things. The cabin was a communal family lodge, so we maintained a, f a full refrigerator. My basket held a few cans of soup, some eggs, a couple bottles of decent Merlot, and a bag of fresh ground coffee. At the last second, I tossed in a package of toilet paper as my nod to keeping the place stocked up. Within ten minutes, I was crossing the bridge over the Boise River and following the two-lane Highway 21. It winds through the old gold-mining territory surrounding Idaho City and terminates in Stanley, deep in the Sawtooth National Forest, one of North America's hidden alpine treasures. I glanced to my left down the valley and watched the cluster of downtown high-rise buildings in the state capitol disappear behind the hills as the road turned north. To my right, the rivers flowed close to the road now. I passed several spandex-suited bicyclists who leaned their helmets forward and pedaled hard into the stiff breeze blowing down the canyon. This part of the forty-minute drive always filled me with anticipation. The high hills closed in behind me and the city disappeared. I was quickly surrounded by rough country. 
Even from the paved highway, I could see tra still see traces of the original Oregon Trail cut into the sides of the Mount Canyon. It felt as if I was literally stepping backward in time. Here I was, speeding down a ribbon of asphalt in my tight little sports car capsule. A single sudden turn of the wheel would catapult me into a brushy ravine where I might not be discovered for months. I loved the wild potential that lived here. Whenever I ventured outside the invisible walls of civilization, I felt unseen storm clouds of stress and fatigue vanish from my spirit. In the newfound silence, I noticed that I had a CD playing with the volume turned down low. The music was like a tiny voice in the distance. I thumbed the volume switch on the steering wheel and Bob Dylan's harsh quaver boomed from the speakers. You used to be so amused at Napoleon and Rags and their language that he used. Go to him now. He calls you. You can't refuse. When you got nothing, you got nothing to lose. You're invisible now. You got no secrets to conceal. How does it feel? How does it feel to be on your own, no direction home, like a complete unknown, like a rolling stone? His distinctive harmonica trailed off and the track ended. I often felt haunted by this song, but now the questions pounded the silent gong that had unsettled me all day long. How does it feel? Yes. How does it feel? An important question was being posed to me. I honestly had no idea what the answer should be. Thirty-five minutes later, I turned off the gravel country road and drove up the sandy driveway. It wound gently between the tall, old-growth ponderosa pine trees on our property. The recent rain and winds had showered the ground with long brown pine needles that crackled under my tires. I stopped the car in front of the lodge. As I got out, I stretched my arms wide and breathed deep. I had lived all over the country and enjoyed most places, but this spot held special magic for me. The majesty of the views from atop our paradise knoll always stunned me. I turned around in a complete circle, the sun warm on my skin. We were surrounded by the higher hills, and to the northeast I could see the jagged Sawtooth Mountains. Our lodge stood on an open-topped hill that rolled down into a wooded meadow. In all, we owned twenty acres, and I loved every square yard. During different times of the year, a herd of elk and flocks of wild turkeys used to used our land as their bedroom. In the evening, we often heard them talking as they grazed and foraged close to the house. I glanced at my watch. Despite sneaking out of the office early and making good time on my trip, it was already almost four o'clock. Up here, the sun would top, touch the top of the mountains in just a couple of hours. Once that happened, night fell fast. The temperature dropped ten degrees as soon as the sun set, and it was already cooler here than down in the valley. I loaded my grocery sacks and duffel bag into the house and walked around checking little details. Everything appeared to be in order. There were a few nearly dead wasps creeping up the inside of the windows. I could smell the funky odor of a dead mouse in one of the traps. This was all normal. I swept the wasps outside and emptied the mouse trap and started a pot of coffee brewing. This was my jittery time. It always hit me like this when I came here to the cabin. My body and soul sensed the need to fall into the natural rhythms of the place, but my mind yanked and pulled, playing tug-of-war. I felt like I needed to be doing something, sort of guilty. The quiet called to me, but I never felt like I had earned the right to stop. The silence itself was dangerous, a seductive siren who would lure me far off my course if I listened to her song. I wandered out to the front porch and leaned against one of the rugged pillars. I closed my eyes and let the sun warm my face. Earthy sage and pine needle scents rose on a soft breeze. Slow down. My mind caught up fragments of the Thoreau quote from the email I'd received earlier. I went to the woods to live deliberately, to front only the essential facts of life and see if I could not learn what it had to teach, to live deep and to suck out all the marrow of life. Suck out all the marrow of life. I went back inside to pour a cup of coffee. Live deep. But I was doing that, wasn't I? I believed in the power of human potential. I had even coined a slogan for my company, a passion for extraordinary service. I was stretched to capacity in my pursuit of the best kind of life. I took risks and carried terrific burdens in my journey toward success. Did Thoreau have other things in mind? I was beginning to think so. The very idea that I might not be living up to an ideal made me uncomfortable. I was all about making the grade in every possible way. The deep gong went off in my solar plexus again, and I had to steady myself against the counter. This has to stop. 
Back outside and down the stairs, I unfolded a canvas camp chair by the fire pit. It was one of the deluxe models with its own built-in footrest. I turned it to face the remaining sunshine, sat down, and leaned back with my coffee cup warming both hands. I relaxed and let my eyes focus miles deep into the bright blue sky. A large black turkey vulture soared high across my field of vision and disappeared. I closed my eyes and breathed. This has been Chapter 1 from The Divine Arsonist, A Tale of Awakening. This is Jacob Norby, the author, reading this book. I started this project to post on YouTube as a special gift to my grandfather, who cannot read very well with his eyes anymore, so I wanted to read this story for him. So I invite you to find out more about this book if you so choose. You can go to the website divinearsonist.com if you wish, and there's more information about where you can find this book. Thanks very much, and watch for Chapter 2 coming up soon.